All right. Well, we have Gilmore, right? Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Okay. So I think we're good. Great. Um, there was a little bit of interference on your side at first, but I think that's gone. You're okay. you're using headphones, right? Yeah. Okay. So I think we're good. Yeah, it was probably just uh, Skype being weird. Let me plug in mine too. Okay. So I'm done. Well, I was thinking I, I wanted to just make a couple of points about the the frame that we're talking in, that it's about engineering or it's about design, right? It's about designing uh, a form of modernity that would be stable, that would have uh, you know long term stability and would work, and would um, maintain prosperity, and and implicit in that is the idea that modernity as it currently exists is unstable. Uh, and I would claim that that's not just because of ideology, it's also because of prosperity, uh, these runaway growth processes, the exponential growth of population and, e and economies, and of course the fact that we're drawing down finite stocks of resources. So this comes out of that that discussion about how do you make modernity work, or how do you keep the good parts of modernity, uh, such as prosperity, such as most children living to adulthood. Um, certainly, I would like uh, a future that has prosperity, that has what we think of as civilization, uh, you know, technological complexity, and a high level of agency for human beings as individuals and as collectives. So that's my, my goal, uh, the design goal. And then the question is, how do you design a system that would work? Um, and so I was proposing uh, one part of it, right? The most important part, the regulation of reproduction. And... Um, what we're separating from this is the political aspect, which is how do you how do you bring that system into existence? And I think we all agree that's very difficult to do. That that political struggle would be very difficult. Yes, I would agree. So we're not really debating that, but I mean it it might be sort of relevant to it, but we're mainly focusing on the engineering or design aspect rather than the political making it real aspect. Right. Okay. Yes. So then. Yep. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, and, and oh, I guess I should just say, since there are three of us, um, let's. I, I know I'm probably breaking the first rule of this already, but let's try to not talk too long. Like talk for about a minute or so, and then stop. You try and give out the word, and then it gets easier, maybe. Hmm. So if, if you hand out the word then it gets maybe a bit oh, easier. If I, yeah, I could do that. I could be the... But I think it's also... I don't want to interrupt people. So, I mean, the main thing is not to talk too long and then stop and uh, a mm, period okay. of dead air then allows others to speak because otherwise I have to go back and, you know, edit yeah. out the talking over and it, or it sounds really bad. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll hand the conch... It's like... Did you ever read The Lord of the Flies? They had that conch that they held, they handed around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'll hand the conch over idea. in a second. <laughs> I'll pass the conch. We'll do that to, to solve the tragedy of the commons in this situation. <laughs> okay, I, I'd like I'd like to seize the chance now and ask you. Well, we'll just hold on, hold on. Just give me one second. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, um, because um, I was going to hand the conch to you in a second. So. Yeah, okay. Um. You wanted to talk about whether uh, abolishing the welfare state would solve the problem, and you also had some criticisms of uh, state-controlled reproduction or the you know state licensing of reproduction. So why don't you present that case, and uh, then we'll let Gilmore respond to it a bit, and then I'll respond to it a bit. All right, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, the general issue that I talked about uh, on Discord was that uh, uh, how um, how intrusive, how demanding does uh, the government uh, will have to be if it is to effectively police reproduction uh, in, in a society where 
we have license and licenses for that purpose. Uh, and uh, that's may maybe where the dif disagreement lies. Uh, I, I believe, at least, I would uh, think that um, the government would actually have to be somewhat intrusive, uh, uh, maybe not in the beginning, but uh, with time, for the simple reason that if we have a prosperous society with uh, capitalism, one of the things that will be uh, demanded in that society is that uh, reproduction be made as often as easy as possible. Uh, and you could imagine a future where, for example, um, we have uh, machines uh, or external uteruses or something of that sort uh, helping us in reproduction. Uh, and in this fictional uh, society that we're talking about now, um, how would you propose, Blithering, uh, that uh, the government in practical terms, not just general, be specific, how would you propose that uh, the government would solve that issue once uh, reproduction can be, can be made uh, uh, in a private sense and is very difficult to, for people to know about. Because I do think that will happen in the future uh, where uh, reproduction uh, will likely be very easy to hide. Well, I don't see how it would be easy to hide. I mean, a human being is not very easy to hide. No, not not in, I don't mean uh, once <laughs> once the kid is born I mean uh, uh, the act of reproduction I I in itself that would be easy to do well but you once you've violated the law by bringing a child into the world uh, you know without the license you could now be subject to stricter forms of social control um, like I, I don't think there's any real practical limit to state power over the individual that, uh, like, I, I don't think this requires more power over the individual than other examples I used, like preventing so, murder. Or, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, let me just, I'll pass it to Gilmore, because I know I said, just give me one second. So, yeah. Um, then, you know, controlling traffic or, uh, what was the other one? Uh, controlling murder. Or rape. I think those things are also somewhat difficult to control, but the state certainly has enough power to do that. Okay, um, Gilmore, go ahead. So, um, Schelke, if I understood you, understood you correctly, you think that um, it will be you will have to be more authoritarian over time to keep this system in place. Uh, I think. Yes. I think. Yes. If you if you think about it in selection in selection terms. That's probably rather the other way around, because you will select for more responsible people, and they won't need to be kept in line by very authoritarian rules. So you will breed out the ones who are um, who are prone to rule breaking. Isn't yes, uh, yes, yeah. general. But uh, if if people do do become more rational with time, then uh, even even that tendency can easily be uh, contracted. Let me be specific, um, because I don't just like to theorize uh, and uh, disagree on theorizing. Let me be specific, and you can counter that specific instance. And if you have a good con counter argument, I I will change my mind on this. But uh, let. Uh, one case would be, for example, this with uh, reproductive machines. Imagine in the future where somebody could have uh, five children at the same time uh, being uh, reproduced at home in the basement, let's say, because they ha have these uh, technical uh, uh, capabilities to do this. And uh, how, how would uh, people even know uh, even if they were really, really responsible by that time, they have been selected for to be uh, responsible. Uh, once that, uh, once that uh, capability exists, uh, and you have a welfare state that will ensure that all these kids will be taken care of, no matter what decisions the parents make. Uh, once you do that, then the incentive exists to have 
uh, these children because as as i said you don't need to have one you don't need to just one uh, you don't need to wait until uh, uh, the children uh, are born you can just start having five at the same time okay. in the basement okay. and produce them and once they are produced it doesn't really matter if you punish it from that point on they have already have a lo had a lot of children that will be ensured to survive into adulthood okay i think that so, i think that scenario is the best case that i can make so if you can uh, show me how that scenario wouldn't work that uh, people in that uh, in such a society where they could have a lot of children at the same time uh, in secret uh, that wouldn't work then i then i'm convinced that we don't so do, so that presupposes yeah. that you can pass that through with your genes. So those basement children will get the genes that are prone to reproduce more basement children. So I don't see the mechanism for that really. Well, the mechanism would be simply if people are more rational than they would uh, with their reproduction. If they are more rational, then they will uh, decide uh, when to have children, uh, and uh, on, in what circumstances and how they could maximize their fitness. For example, uh, blithering and uh, I would both have uh, this value that reproduction in and of itself is very valuable. Uh, and uh, in such a society uh, where I was sure that I could do this, I would actually do it. I would be one of the, uh, these defectors. I wouldn't really care much about uh, what punishment you would okay, have so, for so, me. So that, if that is to be the case, no other incentives could motivate you to do anything else. So if you yeah, do yeah. this and then get thrown into prison for re the rest of your life or get, e get ex executed, you don't care about that. You just care about having as many children as possible. Well, at least in that society I would, because uh, that's, that's my explicit uh, value. It's uh, reproduction and... Uh, uh, in such a society, the only thing that matters is the pr reproductive rate, uh, as many children as you have, because all of them will presumably survive. I, I think there probably is no feasible way to go gradually towards this. There, are this too, there's too big a gap evolutionarily between uh, caring about different incentives, like surviving uh, or ha having more sex or whatever, instead of just producing children. So I don't think I don't think we can jump. It's like going from uh, having no sight to having an eye. You you have to do it in gradual steps, and I don't see the gradual steps here. Really. Well, I can I can I can I can jump in for a sec. Can I just yes jump in? yes um, okay. So I th it's an interesting thought experiment. It is very science fictiony, right? Yes. And yes. the idea that we would have you know, like artificial wombs and basements is a little bit iffy because those would have to be manufactured and presumably they could be outlawed, right? The state can control things like what technologies people have. Um, so you're imagining an individual with an extreme amount of agency and with a very, um, you know, like a mind that is very calculating and uh, is very one-dimensional, which, and, and as Gilmore pointed out, even if you believe consciously that you should have children, um, we're not that kind of creature that will ignore other incentives, and, and we probably never will be. But it still isn't an interesting thought experiment, right? That there might be some, some uh, people who might do something like that. But I also think Gilmore's point is that you, you can't really pass it on because the state is going to figure out what you're doing, right? So it would rely on people rationally coming to this conclusion and acting on it and having this very high level of conscious desire or design or just, you know, agency, individual agency. But I think we shouldn't underestimate the agency of the state either in this envisioned future where everyone is hyper-rational, you know. Let, let me put it this way. If this kind of world existed, new problems would emerge. You know, just as solving the problems of the past created new problems for us to solve, if we were to solve our problems now, we would create a world that has new problems. 
and this might be one of them, although I, I, don't, I don't know that it would be the most important. Um, a world of hyper-rational people trying to reproduce is an interesting science fiction thought experiment. Um, uh, uh, there, are, there are no uh, permanent solutions. There are only trade-offs. So there will always be new problems, no matter what you do. Uh, yeah. Well, of, of course, I'm, I'm not disagreeing that we should implement the ideas that we were talking about uh, previously. I am talking about what do we do, uh, what kind of problems will we have once we're in that society. I'm, I'm moving one step ahead, so, so to speak, uh, and uh, asking myself what kind of problems would we have in such a society where we have already achieved, uh, at least initially achieved, the things that we desire to achieve. Well, if you really got to that point of that hyper-rational society, and presumably you have a bunch of hyper-rational people um, who are capable of negotiating systems to uh, prevent defection, right? So uh, it might even be that if, like, if you get to that point where that's actually an issue, that the society would say, okay, then these children have to be sterilized because that's the rule, or something like that. You know, and, and the hyper-rational population would say, oh, yes, we accept this as the price of maintaining our utopia. So I think there's always going to be a kind of red queen problem that the state and the individual um, can sort of, you know, try to outmaneuver one another on and on into perpetuity, right? There's no end to the state and the individual trying to outmaneuver one another to get the upper hand. But... Um, I, I don't think we should assume that the individual will just win and the state will lose. I don't think that's that's not the story of civilization. And I don't assume that. Uh, what, I, what I mean is that even if this battle, is, as you speak, in a battle between uh, the individual and society would exist, uh, it doesn't really matter if the state wins most of the time or almost all of the time because once it what loses once so, so to speak on a large scale once uh, individuals even if they were uh, capable of just doing this for 10 generations so to speak once uh, in a billion years or so, so uh, or whenever uh, that would effectively destroy that society because the individual just has to win once and once he wins and continues to win for a, for a while like this, he will have uh, increased the population to such an extent that it would be unsustainable. Well, no, no one individual can do that. that. That can only, only the collective could shift the population to that extent. So then you're going to have a world of 150 IQ super calculators and they'll come up with a way to prevent defection. So I, like, I don't think, I, I really don't think this is, um, going to be, I don't think this is an issue. Like I, and I would also just point out, and I'll let Gilmore talk in a second, but we did create civilization. And to some extent, we have already done this. And it was with a more brutal approach, and it did involve disease as well. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't see any reason to believe that we couldn't solve that problem if we ever got to that point. And now, uh, I, Gilmore. I'll just, well, wait, uh, let, uh, let, yes, let, let yes, Gilmore. Gilmore. Mm -hmm. So long as there are no uh, permanent uh, edges for people, uh, it's okay. You can have some parts of the population where there are dysgenic effects going, going on, and some parts where it's neutral, and some parts where it's eugenic, as long as the total sum is zero, and that's okay. So uh, as long as where the dysgenic effect happens shifts around so it's not continually with the same uh, same lines genet genetic lines and then it's okay yeah that was all yeah yes and i i have no problem with anything you said uh, blithering about uh, the fact that the state if it decided to do this and had pop popular support that it could do this my issue isn't that the uh, the government can't do this my issue is how intrusive does the government w will will it have to be to do this? And uh, my uh, this is why I brought uh, and I introduce it here uh, welfare because my idea is that if we at least got rid of welfare, uh, the incentive uh, on the individual level 
would most likely disappear to defect because even if you could reproduce and have 10 children at once uh, in secret uh, whatever way uh, they, they those children would be effectively screwed if you had no uh, means to uh, support them uh, so my, i was um, i was discussing this topic just in the perspective of how do we decide what to do with welfare i wasn't discussing uh, the fact that the government can or can't do this because i agree the gov government can do this they can uh, keep tabs on the population and uh, keep the reproduction eugenic if it really decided to do this but it would as agency increases with time as people become more and more able to do things uh, however, the, however they wish to do things uh, they will be more and m more and more able to defect with time okay. uh, well, and uh, the, the way to go around that issue to remove the incentive completely to defect to begin with at least on a reproductive uh, side would be to eliminate welfare that right, was right. all all I was uh, arguing for right well that was the point you were making before about welfare and so I'm going to let Gilmore take that one because I think he and I agree on this. And then maybe I'll say something after he... he... I, I didn't quite catch that because I had a phone call uh, oh, okay. <laughs> when I'll, he was talking. So It's okay. I'll take I'm it. Sorry. I'll take it and yeah. you can follow up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So the problem with getting rid of welfare is that, um, well, first of all, if you're talking about removing welfare as an adjunct to this policy, but not as a solution in itself, then that might be a long-term thing that you, you might eventually do. Although, that, that, is what, that is what I'm arguing for. Well, perhaps, but I, I, I mean, I think we agreed before, and, and I guess that's why there was a little bit of confusion when we were talking about this on Discord. Um, I think we agreed that, you, that if you rely on uh, poverty to control the population, then the majority of the population has to be at a starvation level. And so that would effectively eliminate prosperity, right? So you can't rely on welfare to eliminate or to, to regulate the population without eliminating prosperity. Because by definition, or sorry, did I say welfare? You can't rely on um, po yeah, poverty to regulate the population unless the majority of the population lives in poverty to the to the like real poverty to the point of starvation yeah, death will have to be a selection factor exactly basically. That, yeah yeah right so if this is just something that you're applying on a like after the system is up and running and then you get these few people popping up who are clever defectors but you take away welfare. I, I suppose at that point, welfare could be scaled down. Welfare could be scaled down eventually because the population would have been raised up with eugenic reproduction to the point where welfare would be a very minor thing, right? Um, so I suppose you could do that, but um, you could also do other things. Like if you discover somebody defecting in this way, you you know sterilize their children or something or you know or or require them to you know pay a, a sort of penalty before they can reproduce there are other ways of doing it yes yes of course uh, and uh, that's uh, that's the issue that i brought forth uh, w which way is the better way and i would assume that in such a society where uh, children um, are already being born to responsible people, meaning the amount of people uh, that would need welfare, at least children, would be uh, very small because uh, if we impose the license first, then the license will, uh, if, in, if implemented, will solve the issue of uh, who has the children and if they can have, uh, if they can support those children. So if the license is imposed first, then you will have a society with, after some amount of time, that uh, almost all children are taken care of. That's the goal, right? Uh, to have children that uh, are ensured to live to uh, adulthood. Uh, 
at least those that are born, most of them. Uh, and in such a society, almost all, or, or yeah, almost all children would be taken care of, even without the welfare. And in such a society, I, my argument was that it would be desirable. Uh, it would be one of the best solutions to remove uh, the welfare state so as to not create a long-term incentive to defect, or at least not uh, spur it as much as uh, welfare does. Um, well, I think it, it, I don't think it really matters. Uh, I, I don't think that's the only way to solve the problem, and I don't think that solves it any better than some other way. It could prob probably be scaled down over time just by like the eugenic factors. So, but I have yes. Yes, I, I had a more practical thing about it, which is that I think that the uh, the reproductive licenses <clears throat> we have a precedence for for that, but we don't have a precedence for um, starving people if the state can afford not to. So I don't think it's possible even to take away the welfare state, except to the extent that we don't need it. Yeah, that might be true. But I would, and I would also say that if you remove the welfare state, but you still have these hyper rational defectors, um, that might not be enough because they might be able to, you know, figure out a way to, um, you know, cheat the system in other ways, like steal. Right. So if they're if they're capable of violating one one law, they can violate others. Um, but I also think I mean, I want to go back to Gilmore's earlier point that if you start out by selecting for people who obey the law and you know obey the rules of society and those people have more children, then I, I think the emergence of this kind of mutation, it, it would be fairly uncommon because you're selecting for a psychology that fits your society you know you're rewarding those who who play by the rules and and civilization has civilized people right yeah so i think the idea that that something like that would pop up i don't think it would ever pop up in sufficient numbers to pose a problem and if it did it could certainly be dealt with by a hyper rational state well, of course, of course, and uh, I, I have no problem that the government, if it was at least as rational as these people, could uh, could solve this issue. My point is how, and that's where I discuss uh, going into. Uh, I I would think that one of the best ways is to remove welfare, precisely because of two reasons. One one is it removes a lot of the incentive to uh, to do this because. At, because even if you can reproduce and have a lot of children, uh, you will uh, actually be decreasing your fitness from from an individual perspective because they will die, and you are, uh, or at least most of them will die. So you are better off uh, in most cases just uh, being within the system uh, and not defecting from it. Uh, that's one. The other issue, because uh, it's, it's not just incentive, it's cost perspective. Uh, because uh, because a government that uh, needs to uh, really police its population uh, to make sure that there are no defectors because there is this incentive of welfare that uh, makes people likely to defect if they can do so easily. It means that you will have to have a government that puts in a lot more resources into policing its population, whatever that uh, way would be. It doesn't really matter if they have police uh, in, in front of the stores, uh, uh, making sure that people, uh, these children don't steal things or uh, going into people's uh, houses to make sure that they don't have any children, uh, unlicensed children or whatever. Uh, you, you, you will have to have a lot more resources being put in from the state to police the population if you have a welfare state well, okay, than well, without let, it. Let, let me respond to some of those things. Okay, so first of all, you're you're assuming certain methods of control that, that I didn't propose. I mean, like going into people's houses and stuff like that. Um, well, like I, I said, I, you, no, no, let me, let me talk. Yes, you, you, yes. you can't easily hide a human being. And so if this were a problem, you could always say, well, these children now have to, you know... Um, pay a debt to society or something to, uh, 
qualify for uh, a reproduction permit, um, you know, or the parent does or whatever, like you could find a, a set of rules that would work um, that don't require like constant monitoring and, you know, micromanagement of the population. Um, I also said you outlaw this sort of, you know, reproduction machines or whatever that might allow somebody to, you know, generate a hundred babies or something. Okay. Um, the other point, which now is slipping out of my mind, was... So, okay, Gilmore, jump in and I'll remember yeah, what was. Yeah, let, let me just say a quick thing. There will always be uh, defectors in evolution. So there are always evolutionary niches. And I think you think that maybe they are stronger than they are. Because you can uh, evolution can tolerate some defection at the margins. Like, say, for example, psychopaths. <clears throat> but if they have, um, they can, if they had uh, always an edge in evolution, they would be more, uh, there would be way more psychopaths than we have. You just have like 2% or something of the population. I, I don't know if those uh, numbers are very sure, but so uh, defection will always occur in some parts. Um, yeah, and I, it, won't, it, it won't always grow to take over the whole population. And so I think you may be overestimating the problem. Uh, I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying defection won't exist. I'm. I do think it will always exist to some degree. And as you say, it's not a problem if it's just done to a marginal uh, frequency. Uh, what I'm bringing. What I'm saying, uh, if I boil it down as small as I can, is that it would be better to remove welfare because it does decrease the uh, reward and the um, feasibility of defecting. It does decrease that incentive. That's all I'm saying. Well, it, certainly you could have a form of welfare, which is you get enough food to feed you and you get a place to live. I mean, that's an example of welfare where it, let's say you fall on hard times, then you and your family move into a certain unit and you get enough food to feed yourselves, but that's it. So you can't really rely on welfare. Like you can't just create children and i mean unless you do have some kind of machine that create 100 children and dump them on the state all at once <laughs> you know i mean without that kind of machinery kids come one at a time right so you can't really rely on welfare to feed your family without exposing what you're doing um the other thing is that you can still cheat even without welfare right you could still have a bunch of kids living at starvation level uh, you know, like just living in absolute misery. That's a bigger issue because um, if you relied on welfare instead of explicitly limiting reproduction, then you create an incentive for people to, you know, live in misery and generate a lot of kids. So in fact, you cannot rely on the absence of welfare to control reproduction. And I guess that's the fundamental point, right? Yes, Not if I, you want prosperity. Yes, and that... And I don't disagree with that point. I'm not saying that this is the uh, solution that will solve all, uh, this problem entirely, or even uh, for the most part. I, I don't. I don't think eliminating welfare is uh, some sort of magical solution. I'm saying, in addition to the permits, it would be wise to remove welfare because it decreases the incentive to defect. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can agree or just make it <laughs> deliver it in a certain way that is um, that, that is very difficult to abuse. I mean, there are various things you could do. But I think we're, we're quibbling over these details that, I mean, it, you know, it's funny that a Swede and a Canadian are arguing over keeping the welfare state. <laughs> it's like <laughs> we have so many big problems right now and if we could ever get to the point of having rational control over reproduction i think we could solve you know we could solve those problems and so yeah i, I don't think it's worth debating this endlessly because we i think we more or less agree in principle that the welfare state is a problem and also however that removing welfare is not a sufficient solution Right. Yeah. So if we can agree yes. on that, I think we're, you know, the rest of it is, is not that important.
Yes, uh, we do agree on that part, and uh, I had no issue with that. I, I, I was just entirely focusing on welfare. May, maybe to what, what do the YouTubers say in an autistic sense? <laughs> I was just focusing on that uh, issue uh, because that was what I was uh, thinking about at the time. That I have no problem with a reproductive permit. I have no problem with the idea that welfare won't solve this problem in and of itself. I have really no problem with just about anything you said. I just said that removing it would be a wise choice for a society that values stability because welfare doesn't really add much to the stability in a, a responsible population. Oh, okay. But it does, it does, uh, it I does. I think we're, add, we're, we're circling yeah. back to the same yeah. thing again. We, we get the, we, we get your point. Um, Gilmore, do you have any thoughts you want to add? No, I don't think so. No. What about your thoughts on the the idea itself? Of, of reproductive permits. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's basically just marriage. So, I well, mean, it a, works. Yeah, yeah. It's a little more than marriage, but it's not that much more. <laughs> It's very similar, but yeah, it has, of course, uh, some other aspects like sterilization if you're on welfare or whatever. But but uh, we know it works. We have seen it work. So mm -hmm. uh, and we have had eugenic um, probably eugenic effects for a thousand years in the Western world before uh, recent times. Uh, which we can see through the drops in violence and, and all of that. I mean, it's just a hy hypothesis, but I think it's pr a pretty strong hypothesis that we yeah. have had. Yeah. It fits the data anyway. So, yeah. Um, what do you think about, uh, well, will we do it? The answer is probably no, we won't. Yeah. But um, do you think the Chinese will do it? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do think so. I mean, I don't know how all the ordinary Chinese think about things. We, what we get from the Chinese, um, maybe we have a romanticized view about what the Chinese think, wh or how the Chinese think, um, because we think that our, their leaders are so are comparably rational. But but um, who knows if they will have the power for for a long time in China? I don't know. So maybe they suffer from the same delusions as us in the end. I don't know. I don't know if culture is so strong that it can overcome modernity. Yeah. Um, since we have a little bit of time left, since we're all here, um, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the, uh, the political problem, but at a, at a high level. Um, it seems to me that it's it's very difficult to get people to consider rational solutions to problems caused by people. <laughs> like, um, it seems that the the right seems to always want to either defend a status quo or go back to a status quo of the recent past or maybe even the distant past. Yeah, and. Like that's all I see out there, and th that's not going to work because um, because things have changed, right? And do you have any thoughts on how to um, push an idea like this in culture? Like, how do you shift culture to you know save the world? How do you like? It's like the Titanic is going toward the iceberg. The iceberg is there, but everybody's comfortable. They're sipping their lattes on the deck, and you know, we need to steer away from the iceberg. But anyone who suggests steering away from the iceberg is um, vilified. You know, it's a strange situation we're in. How do we do it? Yeah, it has the worst aspects for both sides, I think, because it's a top-down project um, with uh, new solutions. And that is all the things that the right hates. But the goals of it, 
are counter to the left. So, so it has it has the absolutely worst uh, outlook that you could possibly think of. Um, I don't think the goals are counter to the left, but I think that the means are counter to the left. Hmm. I think the left can agree with the goals. It's it's um it's that both sides would have a hard time agreeing to the means. I think both sides would agree with the goals actually. You know, the the end result being no poverty, everybody, you know, gets to live in this kind of paradise, you know, <laughs> maybe not. I mean, mm. it wouldn't be a paradise. Nothing ever is, but well the the go, the, the the goal is um or maybe you sort that under the means, but the goal is in short, culling the weak genes. So, I mean, that goes pretty much straight against the the left dogma. Yeah, it it, it does go against leftism to some extent because it first of all it, it goes against their view of the world. Yeah, it mainly goes against their their um, moral narrative of you know the the way to get progress is the weak have to get uh, more from the strong you know the strong have to give up stuff to the weak it's not that the weak must be weeded out of the population so yeah it, it's a tough sell for the left but on the on the other hand the moral narrative can change around i mean in the 30s or in the 20s and the progressives were eugenicists um of a different kind perhaps but i mean it was a very different time there was um uh, a book by by two uh, uh, by two Swedish economists named uh, their, their their last name is Myrdal, and they they wrote a book in they were big social democrats and they wrote a book on the population question, which mm. tackled like eugenic policy, uh, mm. and it was a huge one. It influenced uh, state policy in Sweden for decades. Really, yeah. in what way? Um, well, um, we had, um, what's it called? Family planning? Yeah, yeah. Um, we had a, a, an, an institute that sterilized people who were of weaker, I mean, you know, mm. the, the, basically the, the, the handicapped and so on, oh, uh, and, and people of certain minorities. So that, that's like a huge, um, um, Hot potato yeah, yeah. Uh, up to uh, up to I think seventy five. So it, it went on for a long time. Um, yeah, it's funny how eugenics used to be more or less taken for granted as a sort of obvious necessity, <laughs> and now it, it's like the the most evil thing, even though it's impossible to argue against rationally. Yes, and that problem with the. Uh people on average is as you, I don't know who, who it was that phrased it initially like this, but pe people don't think. Most, most of these ideas are accepted or rejected not on their merits, but uh, on uh, the benefits to, uh, you know, opportunistic individuals. And they, are, they aren't really, uh, because, because we, uh, people haven't been selected for to create large scale stable societies. We we don't we don't think in that matter, and we are not at least the average persons. These kinds of discussions that we are having now, um, you're not really able to have them uh, with most people because it's all over their head. They don't they have never thought about these issues uh, in a, a rational sense. They just moralize uh, or uh, virtue signal or do all kinds of short-term opportunistic uh, say, uh, things that uh, in the long term uh, will destroy that society on a collective level. But uh, they don't think. And that's the main issue that I have with most people, that if you even ask them to think, you propose something, you tell them, hey, uh, I have this idea, what do you think about this idea? And most of them will just look at you strangely and, th and think that you're some weird uh, sociopath that uh, is out to <laughs> get them in some way. And uh, they, they, they refuse to even consider these ideas on a rational level. They just moralize and uh, feign outrage and that kind of shit. I don't, yeah. think they I don't think they feign, mostly. I think 
most people have an instant emotional reaction to something which is coupled in their mind with taboo topics, taboo things. And that's probably the first thing that we all, no matter the subject, even if it's on a completely other subject, that's the first thing you have to break down to try to reach rational discussion. But it's hard. And I don't think you can do it with like the general population at all. I think you can only do it in certain circles. The problem is in the modern world or in the Western world anyway, that even those circles are completely infected with, <laughs> with uh, this kind of non-thinking. Um, mm. I don't know if it's actually different from before. It's just that the subjects have shifted around. So say 300 years ago, there were those, those same kind of taboos around Christia Christian ideas, for example. But those ideas are now not taboo, but we have all these other taboos that affect us now. Mm -hmm. which, is, which is, in a way, though, somewhat hopeful because it means that cultures can, can shift, shift around. Yeah, yeah. However, yeah, it's interesting to think how exactly did we get here? Was it just prosperity alone? Was it Christianity plus prosperity? Was it um, was it the you know the Frankfurt School? <laughs> you know, like to what extent did people act into culture to get us here? And to what extent did we just flow down the stream of history and end up here? Well, I, I do think uh, these uh, philosophies that you hear uh, around on. YouTube uh, that uh, attribute uh, our modern prosperity to some sort of uh, uh, grand progress for human humankind in the that we have become a lot smarter, a lot uh, a lot better at uh, empathizing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with each other. Mm -hmm. I do think that most of these uh, theories that put uh, the credit on our part uh, are um, are overstated. I do think it's a lot of uh, uh, happenstance, a lot of... Uh, uh, because Im imagine if we had been born into this world as we are. It's the exact same world, but uh, the world didn't contain any fossil fuels, for example. Just, the, just eliminating that one resource, we wouldn't uh, very likely be here uh, talking about these issues to begin with. We wouldn't be as prosperous as we are, because a lot of it is just that we yeah. happened to stumble over fossil fuels. And we happened to stumble over it uh, at a time where we could use it uh, mm. once. Uh, so a, a lot of it is just mere coincidence, so to speak. Uh, our tendencies uh, happened to match uh, the resources that we have around us. Yeah. And if those resources hadn't, uh, at least some of them hadn't, been here, we would still be living as we did uh, hundreds of years ago. Right. But I mean, with our culture, the cultural shift, like the, the, you know, humanist religion, the obsession with all the LGBT stuff and all, all of those changes. And I guess I'm going to address this to Gilmore first. To what extent do you think people consciously shifted the culture, you like by having control or getting control of institutions, or to what extent is that just the institutions were sort of fated to be captured or be, you know, be infested with certain kinds of people, yada, yada, yada. Like, to what extent do you think there was agency involved in shifting the culture over the last, you know, 50 years or so? Mm, there was agency involved, that we so, know, because, because people say they want to do things and that they they do them. What we see in, like you said, in the Frankfurt School and other, other ideas from the universities and so on. But I'm not sure they imagined this future, or I don't think they imagined this future at all. So, but do you think uh, that they shifted the culture? Yeah. Or do you think that the culture was just shifting and they they rode along on the, the coattails of history? Mm. Because you know, there's that that um bias toward like the successful people always think it was their initiative that got them there right yeah 
Like if you look at the successful ideas and you can look back in history and say, oh, these people were talking about that 30 years ago, they caused this or maybe 100 years ago or whatever. But it's also the case that all kinds of people were talking about all kinds of things yeah, yeah, yeah. at that time and only a few of them end- came true. So like, did the Frankfurt School have any real effect? Not to the extent that some people imagine, no. Yeah, but maybe some effect. Maybe, yeah, I think there's some effect. But both, I mean, both the kind of, you know, the Jordan Peterson, he talks about the postmodern neo Marxist and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think he's overselling it. And I think, I think also the guys who talk about the conspiracies, also the real, you know, the ethnic conspiracies, yeah. they also oversell it massively. Um, but... Well, well, I think that that's because there's a bias toward certain kinds of explanations and away from others. There's a bias toward explanations that involve agency yeah. and, and involve enemies, you know, or bad ideas. Like, I think the the liberal, the liberals or the liberalists, you know, the, the anti-SJW people, they seem to believe that it's just that some bad ideas just happen to get into people's heads somehow you know and the solution is you just tell people that oh those ideas are wrong you just appeal to them with reason and then pop the ideas disappear from their heads and everything is fine which seems like a very strange view like how could you possibly believe that all the evidence goes against it when you have an idea in your mind it's very hard to dislodge and you can see this again and again that's why we have religions and right that's that's why humans do most of the things politically that they, that they do. So, yeah. Right. But the thing is, we did switch religions. So I'm just, I'm curious, yeah. like, how did we switch religions? How did we switch values and and moral narratives and everything to such an extent that we ended up here? I mean, I have some idea myself. But... That, that's the thing. I'm not sure we shifted that much. And we have, you have talked about this before, and I think we have talked about this before, that humanism isn't that radical a shift from what we had before. Yeah, it certainly has its roots in Christianity, but it is a shift in the values that people profess on an everyday level. Like the signaling is quite different. I think it's more a change in emphasis than a change in kind. Mm. So all the things that the humanists are very hung up on are things that you can see Jesus say, like uh, turn the other cheek and um, all of that, uh, that, you, that you should hold up the poor over the rich. And I, I can't quote the Bible very much, but you know, all those kinds of things can be seen in the Bible. Um, so, yeah, Christianity certainly has, has something to do with it. It's just that we ignore other stuff. Like, we ignore the... Um, the the Ten Commandments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we ignore the more rough stuff. Yeah. Well, so, Shkelkim, um, is that how you pronounce your name? Shkelkim? <laughs> uh, Shkelchin. Shkelchin? Uh, chim. Chin? T-S sound? Shkelchin? <laughs> no, Chim. Chim. Uh, ch, chim. Ch. Okay, Shkelchim. I'll, I'll try to remember that. Uh, what what do you think as a kind of cultural outsider? Like how, um, because you're you were Muslim or you you grew up in a Muslim culture. Yes. Um, it it probably seems humanism and and modern values probably seem weirder to you, right? Because you you don't have that Christian background, I guess. Does it seem really weird, or can you imagine? Uh, no, no. Not at all. Uh, most Albanians, even uh, religious uh, Muslims, tend to agree with this. They just have uh, additional ideas around these things. What uh, what is uh, what does it what is good for people? They can differ on, but everybody agrees. For example, on uh, altruism in general, that we should uh, take care of people, that we should help people when they need help. And being selfish is a bad thing. I I have never met any person uh, in my <laughs> life uh, that that uh, would uh, have uh, any sort of dif- disagreement with the idea that selfish equals bad. Uh, all of them take mm-hmm. this as a fact, 
And if you argue differently, even if someone I met maybe at some point did uh, disagree with him, nobody says it. It's it's uh, one of the biggest uh, <laughs> taboos that uh, exist, and it, it's equally common uh, among uh, uh, among uh, Muslims, uh, whether they are very religious or not. Everyone at least pretends. Some of them are <laughs> do pretend because they know better, but. Uh, at least everyone pretends that we should help others, that altruism is desirable and good, and anyone that disagrees with it, uh, even if you disagree with it uh, on a practical level as we do, we don't disagree with, with it on a moral level in the sense that we don't think it's uh, evil to be altruistic or something like that. We, ju we just disagree with, uh, for the most part, uh, if it's feasible uh, and uh, even just bringing that point forward uh, is next to impossible with anyone. Yeah, I have brought it up uh, uh, on a few occasions and uh, uh, people just stare at you. They don't even respond. Uh, they, they just think you're uh, being cuckoo mm. or, or evil. Uh, they will yeah. outright say that you're evil. Uh, one of... One of um, I talked with you earlier about the the, the, the friend that I had met two days ago that I hadn't seen for a while, and somehow he joked about uh, uh, the issue of slavery. He he said he jokingly asked me, uh, "What do what do you think about slavery?" And of course, uh, I just virtue signaled uh, because I didn't want to really have. A, uh, that hmm. discussion with these people because I, I know you what didn't I'm want to come about. come out as pro-slavery <laughs> no <laughs> no I, I didn't I didn't want to say my honest response my honest response is as long as the, as long as the, is as long as it doesn't affect me and the people I care about I don't really care much about slavery if someone somewhere in the uh, in Africa let's say uh, because we mentioned Africa uh, is enslaved I'm not going to pretend like that's a big issue to me uh, yeah. because it's not. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect anyone I care about. It's just an issue for some people somewhere. Uh, and uh, I did, But I couldn't really say that because if I said that I didn't care about these people and they don't really care about them either because they don't do anything different to me. They just virtue signal. That's the difference. Uh, if I brought it uh, out, uh, that issue, uh, they would just have looked at me as if I was evil. I didn't want to have to deal with that, so I just uh, am, uh, answered with some platitude like, um, yeah, yeah, slavery is bad, so of course we shouldn't have it, uh, as if I really cared when I yeah. did. Are you still there? Yes. Oh, okay. It just sounded like you cut off. Um, it's almost like the internet has changed culture in a way that is making some of these lies more more obvious you know it's exposing not only the lies of the media and the establishment the government all that but it's also kind of exposing that a lot of these things that we say on an everyday basis are lies and because people can go online and and anonymously say them and you realize wow a lot of people uh, you know, feel this way or think this or whatever. Um, we're we're in an interesting period culturally, right? Things are going to shift because of the internet, I think. Very much well, so. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also that's one of the positive aspects. The other is that people tend to segregate on the internet. So if uh, you make uh, arguments that uh, critique some sort of narrative that they want to. Follow. Mm -hmm. They just they just don't watch your content. They just ignore you. Uh, and uh, uh, the internet is really good at doing this because you don't you don't have to watch anything. You have to make a case for someone to watch it or in some way, or they just stumble upon it. And if they don't like it, they you know change the video. And yeah. for example, on YouTube. So there is a lot of uh, self segregation, uh, a lot more than it was uh, previously, because previously. Uh, you know, you had the people around you. You couldn't really change them. You had yeah. to deal with what, whatever you had. Well, but now, it's not, yeah, it's not perfect. It's not creating a you know a, a rational 
discourse space that spans the world or anything like that. But it is creating this chaos in which a lot of things dissolve fairly quickly. Um, and I was thinking about that, that like you can look at the history of some of these online movements, like take anarcho-capitalism. Some of these things kind of popped into existence and faded away within a few years, you know, and, and you can see like online debate does... It, it doesn't lead people to rational beliefs, but it does destroy irrational beliefs to some extent. So if you, if you want to preserve your beliefs, you have to enclose yourself in a little bubble, right? Which people are more and more doing. But, um, there is this, uh, like out there in that, in that harsh environment where people can say anything they want anonymously, ideas die really easily. Well, to, to some extent, some ideas are really dying. You mentioned some of them, but some of them, other ideas have been uh, there uh, for a very long time and they haven't changed. Uh, I mentioned one earlier, altruism. It, I don't know no popular channel, not not one. Uh, the most popular I know is yours, Blithering Genius. And you're, you, as you know, your channel isn't really that huge, right? Popular is not the word you would use to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, and my point is that uh, I know no popular uh, channels, not even one, uh, where uh, the people who have that channel don't believe in altru, or at least don't profess altruistic ideas. All mm -hmm. of them pro profess altruistic ideas. All of them, when when they may mention selfishness, tend to condemn it. No, no, I, I, I know. But what I'm saying is that that they can all get savagely attacked by, by trolls. All of those virtue signalers can be taken down by trolls if they swim out of their little safe zones. What, yes, what do you yeah. think about it, Gilmore? Yes. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem like it, it decreases it, though. It seems like it's constant. Mm -hmm. um, when you watch those cliches or like this, this stereotypical kind of arguing, well, you see people say, uh, say these, these um, cliches like uh, we should be on the right side of history or something like that. Um, it doesn't seem like there is a mechanism to, to pull that back. Yeah. But um, I don't know. Um, I have experienced, I, I think, I feel kind, I feel like these kind um when you when you watch like the mainstream narrative, it's kind of jarring these days yeah. to see it. That people still believe it, that they haven't yeah. taken your journey, that they're still stuck in yeah. like this crazy world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. But yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I have anything intelligent to say about that, but it's very it's very interesting. I was always a kind of marginal. I was a libertarian when I was like 14 years or something. So oh, I've yeah. always been way outside, but it feels like it has become even more intense that the mainstream mm -hmm. and, and maybe people in other kinds of, like the SJWs also experience this. I don't know, but it feels like the mainstream and the subcultures have drifted apart very much. Yeah, yeah. There's been a, a, a big fragmentation, but, but in a way that's the chaos that's being created, that there isn't, um, there's no unifying narrative. Um, I, I think we should wrap it up. I just want to say one final thought and then I'll let you guys respond to it. Um, I was talking about blind spots before, right? Like how we don't see problems emerging out of our own actions we tend to look for enemies and bad ideas but we don't look for problems emerging out of altruism or out of morality you know, out of goodness we see goodness as the answer and of course we've we've been trained by countless movies and all that propaganda that the solution to every problem is goodness you know it's for the individual to just find it in their heart to be a better person and then they win somehow. They win the war, or the, whatever the struggle is, and there's a happy ending. And people find it very difficult to accept that the problem might be, first of all, intrinsic to them or to human nature. And the problem might be 
morality itself, right? That goodness might be the problem and the solution might be something that you would consider evil. Um, and But the, the only, I guess, glimmer of hope is that in this chaos of competing moral narratives that in which like none of them are very stable in a in like you think about the environment of the internet as being kind of like rationality and all of the little ideologies are like little bubbles and they only use rationality to attack each other they don't really use it to build their own their belief systems right they just use it to attack each other's belief systems but there is kind of a crumbling of the all of the narratives like there's a kind of chaos emerging and maybe I don't know, maybe that will, uh, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we just need to go through this period of, like, complete uh, annihilation of all these delusions. I'll end it there and I'll let you guys respond. Well, uh, I, I, I had one more question for Gilmore since earlier. Can I ask it or do you, do you have a short amount of time? Uh, oh, that's fine with me, yeah. Okay. Uh, the question you said earlier, Gilmer, that uh, there's no way to convince the commoners, uh, you know, average people, uh, how um, how to to do this. You can only do this in certain circles. Uh, that's what you said. Uh, I was wondering um, what what circles, how, which people can you do this with? Because I don't mm -hmm. really know any. <laughs> no, my, 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 my only point was that uh, history is not moved really by the masses. It's moved by a clique of people. There is a clique of people that uh, brought on the uh, French Revolution or any, any such event. Um, the, the intelligentsia, even if, even if I think maybe the power of ideology is sometimes overstated that doesn't mean that there are a, a few couple of people who can move the needle very much and i don't think i don't think the masses have much to do with it you just need to have the masses on your side like julius caesar for example he just got the masses on his side and then he could act and do whatever he wanted yeah yeah, but they do. They do. They are somewhat important, at least nowadays, because of democracy. So uh, you can't really uh, go out in on in political life and espouse the kind of ideas we are talking about here. You wouldn't go anywhere uh, because of the commoners. It's not because uh, uh, the people at the top uh, don't like you, even though they may might not like you also. But uh, take Trump. Take Trump for example. He's not very popular among uh, uh, the elite class, uh, at least initially wasn't. Uh, but he got into power because he could appeal to the masses. And in a de democracy, as long as you can appeal to the masses, to the biases the masses have, uh, you, you can't to some extent ignore um, uh, the, the, the top branch, as long as you have enough appeal among uh, the lower scale of the po population, so, so to speak. Uh, so I do, I do think uh, commoners are very important, uh, at least in a democracy, because you can't uh, affect any change on a political level without them, uh, because they will do everything to counteract anything you would want to do. If Trump decided uh, today uh, to do the kind of things we would... Uh, uh, we were espousing now. The only thing that would happen is, at best, is uh, he could affect some policies in for a while, a short term. Then he would uh, be voted out of office, and uh, everything would uh, revert to what it was previously. So, uh, if, if if we can change the masses, uh, I don't think uh, we can uh, change anything as long as we have democracy. We will. Uh, we will actually have to abandon democracy too, if well, we are not to, to appeal to the masses, because they will use that democracy yeah. to undermine our our, our ideas. Right, right. Well, you you can't just. Um, I I don't think you can appeal to the masses with uh, like a rational view of the world at the kind of level we're talking about. 
you have to appeal to them with something else. But um, I, I don't know. Like it, it's it, we're at an interesting point where the the intellectuals are in some ways stupider than the masses, right? Like the masses can just see things right up. Like it doesn't take a genius to figure out that oh, Muslim immigration might have some negative consequences. You know, it's sort of like. You walk down the street, you can feel it, right? You can just feel they're not really friendly to me or whatever, right? The common people might not, uh, they, they don't have, they don't have a, a rational understanding of it, but they might have a better just gut intuitive understanding of, of, uh, what's going on and where we should go, at least in the short term. Um, yes, uh, so, so can I respond to a bit yes. of that with, with Trump? So most of Trump's support is soft support. So he doesn't have actually have the masses. He has a plural plurality of the of the of the public, and he can't do very much without uh, support from some very key people in the government and in the so-called deep state, um, who are the actual people who can decide things. Number and number two. Um, if we if we grant that the intelligentsia uh, has um, affected how the modern world world has uh, progressed, then then we have to say that, like for example, the Frankfurt School or the Marxist a hundred years ago, they were talk, talking about very very unpopular ideas, and they have permeated throughout uh, the world since then. So, I think that um, you, you, you can actually see that it's not the masses that matter that all that much. They are easily swayed. Or well, at I, least I, portions I, of the masses, masses are always easily swayed. So you can have the huge Obama effect. Um, if you remember, like the, 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 um, his meetings when he was elected for the first time, and then you can have Trump on the other side this time. But that's just, that's, quite few people that's just a couple of hundred thousands or maybe a million or something it's it's not that much that came to the rallies that is yes yeah. I, I i have no problem with what you say i do agree that uh, ma the masses can be uh, easily swayed my point was that uh, you need to sway them uh, so, even if it's easily done with uh, Fictitious reasons. Sometimes. But you don't need to. You no, don't need to sway fifty-one percent. You only need to sway a certain proportion of the public. Do you, Do you think that the target of persuasion, the initial target, should be the intelligentsia? Yes. Like, say, Steven Pinker. That's what I think. You have to target those people. Or, or not even swaying, but overtaking intelligentsia, like the, the long march through the institutions that the Marxists did. That's what yeah. you have to do if you want to win. Or, well, I mean, it might be possible to to even have an effect on, because some of these people are moving over to the right, to some extent. Like Steven Pinker is now almost on the right. Even if they don't want to be on the right, even if they don't think of themselves that way, the left is kind of pushing them over there anyway. That's true, yeah. And I, I was thinking a combination of, of kind of mocking their, their virtue signaling or their humanist pretensions and rational arguments, although that's not going to work on the masses. If you can get people like Sam Harris, Pinker, those guys to shift their views or at least open up the, their personal Overton windows, that might actually do something. I think that that's already happening. Not yeah. To the extent that maybe we would like it, but anyway, it is happening. I think. Yeah, I agree, and I think that should be the main focus, and not trying to appeal to the masses because that's just going to degenerate into something stupid. Yes, yes, of course, the masses aren't brilliant by any means, but I was I was bringing the democ democracy aspect into this. I was saying that maybe um, democracy so to speak, is a problem uh, working against us. Uh, because even if we could appeal to some, let's say we could convince 20% of the academics uh, and 20% of the politicians, the academics uh, would uh, suffer uh, very 
uh, steep penalties to their careers uh, because of the other people uh, working against them and the politicians, more importantly, uh, would uh, uh, have a very short career because the masses, if you don't bring the masses into it, when you have a democracy, you suffer the risk of them working against you. Uh, and I was bringing the point that if we are to have a democracy, we need to have at least some level of popular support, even if it's not 50%, it needs to be at least a few percentage points. It can't be as it is currently in uh, less than 1%. We need to either be somewhat appealing to the masses, even if it's just to some of them, or we maybe need to change the idea of democracy to begin with so that uh, the commoners don't become as important to the politics. Well, I would, I would also like to add one thing, and that is that all, all successful political movements always have a two-tiered strategy. So um, the, the, the guys on the leftist on the street, they say, kill all the bankers. And then <laughs> the, the academics... They say, well, actually, we only want to, you know, expropriate or whatever. Uh, and, and they put like a nice spin on it. They mean basically the same thing. Um, and then the politicians are funded by the bankers. So it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so you, can, you can have a movement that appeals on different levels. Well, let me be specific, because that's the question I was uh, wondering a bit uh, to you. Do you think that we would be from our strategy point of view. Do you think it would be better to undermine democracy, at least as we currently have it, so that the masses don't really have that much to say? Because if you can't appeal to them, if you can't change their mind, the only way to force all of this on them then is to take the power away. And some of I, that power is okay. democratic. I, I, I don't actually know because to the extent that we have democracy now, I actually think it is mostly a halting effect on on what the the rulers are doing. So I'm I'm unsure. I don't like democracy very much, but uh, um, what we have seen in the elections in the past year or two is uh, is that the actual democratic institutions, uh, that is the the elections they have had a halting effect on what the rulers do. Yeah, that's a good point. But I, I'm curious then, that just sort of brings up something. Why do you guys think the establishment is going down this path to like just flooding the West with immigrants? And uh, like, why is the establishment so leftist? Is this just opportunism at a low level or is there something else or, or is it just ideology or, or is there something else going on well, what's your explanation one, one thing that i think maybe is underappreciated is the well maybe it's not underappreciated but anyway the um there is a demand from global companies to have the same rules everywhere because it is uh, it is more more easy to operate under those circumstances. So if they get the same regulations and rules everywhere in all jurisdictions, they can keep competitors at bay because it's harder to um, it's harder to reach up to the level you have to uh, you have to have uh, to have compliance with the rules. So they create an olig olig oligopoly by those means, and and that that's. I think a huge thing in globalization that maybe people don't see happening. All the big companies, even even not even the big ones, all companies want to have rules that are the same basically everywhere, environmental and and so on. Um, mm. And so they don't they want uh, the differences between countries to lessen. I, I can understand that, but they're not actually accomplishing that, right? They're just accomplishing chaos in the West and every other place staying pretty much the way it is. Or maybe the other places are changing too as they become you know, more modern. But, but that would happen with or without this sort of immigration 
stuff. And I mean, like you can see Starbucks kind of shooting itself in the foot over this incident, right? Why? <laughs> like companies need to have the rule of law. They need to have control over their over their environments. And I, I mean, I get that there's an oligopoly emerging, and that that uh, to, there there is there are incentives for them to push certain leftist policies. But like the full scope of what's happening seems to go way beyond what would benefit the mm. the ultra rich the oligopolies any of that stuff the big all right so, so so that part with i mean corporate anti-racism or what whatever you want to call it i think that's that's an that's an hr is issue i was thinking more about uh, the actual big picture um laws like open borders that that's that stems i think from from mm. global companies uh, having in their self-interest to have the rules the same everywhere. But, but how does open borders create the same rules? It doesn't. It just makes people flee from the poor countries to rich countries, uh, you know, cause the welfare state to be burdened. And, it, you know, like, how does that help them? Um, well, uh, it, it's... Um, I, I'm thinking about trade now. So maybe... I agree with the trade point. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a certain the globalization push certainly is connected to these huge multinational corporations wanting to globalize the rules of business and stuff like that, and they want a global world for that reason. And maybe open borders is a kind of ideological hitchhiker or something, but it it still doesn't really make sense if if the West is destroyed, their Starbucks goes down with it, right? Yeah, like, maybe it'll be in Japan, but. Well, have you? I'm. I'm asking now. Uh, have you seen uh, the experiments where they give people uh, the choice of either getting more of something, let's say, two hundred bucks, if everyone else gets two hundred bucks, or uh, they get less, let's say, a hundred bucks, uh, but uh, the people around them get even less, uh, like twenty dollars, uh, and uh, have you seen those kinds of experiments? I'm addressing this to both of you. Yeah. No, no, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, and there are quite a lot of people uh, that probably use that kind of strategy where they don't just try to uplift themselves, but try to uplift themselves relative to others by uh, decreasing their standard of living, or in this case. Uh, so I, I do think that may, uh, there are a lot of people, uh, I couldn't say how many, but some, uh, on uh, on uh, the upper echelons of society that uh, have the instinct like these people in the experiments had. They aren't thinking about re this rationally. They, they're just following their instincts. They have the instinct to uh, favor ideas that uh, screw over people uh, uh, on the lower echelons so that they uh, can appear even more powerful and attracti attractive, etc., uh, mm. rel relative to them. So I do think there is at least some tendency for some people in power to favor ideas that are destructive, that they even might, on a subject uh, on an uh, instinctual level, realize are destructive, but they favor them because even if it destroys their society to some extent, they th feel or think that they will not be affected, but they will yeah. benefit. And until now, that has uh, be, uh, proven itself mostly correct, because these ghettos, uh, where all, um, these problems tend to uh, concentrate, they, they aren't where uh, these li liberal uh, rich elites are living. Uh, they are living uh, segregated on, uh, in some parts of the country, while uh, the ghettos are forming in other parts of the country. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they send their kids to private schools and they live in the nicest neighborhood and they Yeah. So they they have so, so they have been able until now at least uh, we'll see in the future to screw over a lot of people while benefiting themselves relative to them because if the population of um, a lot of poor immigrants increases then uh, the attractiveness of being wealthy and powerful yeah. Uh, yeah. increases relative to them. Yeah, they have even more status. The middle class, uh, a large and prosperous and comfortable middle class, 
doesn't give them high status, but a huge pool of uh, people lower down increases their relative status. Yeah, I think you're right. I think a lot of this is just driven by like primate social competition instincts that have no like that are just out of whack with the modern world. Uh, yeah, I think it's craziness all the way down, basically. I, I don't think the establishment has a plan. Um, what do you think, Gilmore? Uh, no, I, I completely agree. There is no comprehensive idea of what's to come. The, it, everything is um, just uh, haphazard. Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of monkeys <laughs> <laughs> running amok. All right. Well, we should probably wrap it up. I'll talk to you guys later. Yep. All right. Have a, talk to you have later. a nice day. Bye. All right. Have a good one. Bye.